Hello. Today I'm going to take you through a hand analysis. Uh, I'm going to be looking at a spot from Poker Out Loud, the student edition, uh, episode six. Uh, this is the last hand of the episode. It's a button versus big blind situation between Christian Soto and Chris Convalenka. Uh, I'll link in my profile or the notes below uh, the link to the, the Poker Out Loud season, the Solve for Why YouTube channel, and the specific uh, episode that I'll be covering uh, within this video, uh, but I'll also be showing clips of the specific hand uh, within this video as well. Now this is my second analysis of a Poker Out Loud hand. Uh, the first one was a hand between uh, Berkey and Chris Price from episode two. Uh, and you can check out my YouTube videos for a link to that video. Uh, this one I actually found particularly interesting, uh, not because of the size of the pot, and um, it's actually a very small pot, uh, it's only about 30 big blinds deep, uh, but instead I, I found it interesting because uh, you know, these button versus big blind spots are, are really tough spots that we often find ourselves in, uh, not only as the big blind, uh, you know, in that case we're playing out of position with a wide range, um, but also as the button, we're trying to navigate another wide range in, in this spot, and uh, they're just pretty challenging. Um, we'll get into the specifics in this video, uh, but I actually think that there are a lot of opportunities in these spots uh, that we can take advantage of potential exploits from our opponents and potentially gain some EV. Uh, as always, I'm going to start by looking at the specific hand at equilibrium, but I'm also going to apply some of the in-game analysis from Chin and from Chris to better model the scenario based on their observations. Now, to start off, I, I did put up this slide in the last video, but I wanted to call a few things out again um, to, to keep in mind. And again, this, this really might be obvious to some people, but I think it's really good to call it out. Uh, the first bullet there is the solver output is only as good as its input. Um, I, again, um, you know, solvers, uh, they are great as uh, calculators running in-game simulations based on the inputs that we provide, but the greater the error that we have within our inputs, the worse our solution will be. And I'm gonna demonstrate a little bit of that within this video as well too. Um, as ranges become wider, um, as we change some assumptions in those inputs, we're going to see drastically different responses that we should be taking as a result of things. So, um, you know, again, a solver output is only as good as the inputs. Um, deviations in some of those inputs, the second point here is uh, those deviations can and will change the output. Um, and, you know, sometimes things, those shifts aren't going to change things very much, but other times small changes can result in big shifts in our EV and our strategies. Uh, so you know, we'll demonstrate a little bit of that within this video as well too. Um, our solutions, the third point here, are going to assume that both players in the hand play unexploitably on current and future streets, unless I node lock a decision point. Um, now, and even when I do node lock a decision point, um, it also assumes that players are going to be playing unexploitably and perfectly on future streets. Um, and then finally, it's impossible or at least very difficult to perfectly validate a line within a solver. Uh, I, I think they're great, great tools um, that we can use to confirm hypotheses uh, and help us give ourselves more insight into our frequencies, our range construction, um, but they really shouldn't be used to try, to try to confirm a very, very specific line for one hand. So again, with that all said, I, I want to put this caveat up that this isn't um, the end all be all. This is just an analysis at uh, uh, this specific hand um, and trying to get some takeaways or develop some takeaways uh, based on um, our own assumptions or things that we're actually going to put into the solver. Uh, the hand in question, and you know, I'll show a clip of this, but um, it's uh, a 510 no limit game. Uh, our two players are uh, Christian Soto Chin on the button, um, who started the hand with uh, $2,930, uh, so just over uh, 290 big blinds. 
um, and Chris Convalenka in the big blind with a little bit over five thousand dollars, so uh, five hundred big blinds. So we're pretty deep. And um, preflop uh, chin raises to three x uh, on the button with uh, queen eight of clubs. Uh, pretty standard open, and Chris calls uh, with ace ten offsuit from the big blind. A pretty standard defend. Um, there's about sixty five dollars in the pot. Uh, and the flop comes ace king eight two tone with the king and the eight um, both being of the same suit. Uh, Chris checks uh, chin puts a down bet of about a quarter pot uh, for fifteen dollars in, and Chris calls. Uh, the turn is the six of diamonds, putting a second flush draw on the board with ninety five dollars in the pot. Uh, both players check on the river. The queen of diamond comes, uh, giving chin two pair and Chris uh, top pair. Um, Chris bets out about a third pot into uh, into Chin um, uh, with his top pair. Chin raises to 110, and Chris calls. So I think this hand's really interesting, and it's a hand that I want to explore a little bit. Uh, so we're going to start by setting up the, the solve, um, but first I'd like to watch a clip from the hand and watch the preflop action to help give us some insight into how we actually might set up uh, this solve and how we actually might input these ranges. So let's take a look at the action from Poker Out Loud. Queen 8 suited. It's going to be an open here. Uh, pretty standard. So, I think that it would be a mistake to 3-bet this sort of hand class that can dominate other 1-pair hands uh, that wouldn't call a 3-bet, like Jack-10 off, 9-10 off, Ace-8 off, those kinds of things. So, I'm going to retain all those through a call and take the showdown value. So now that we've heard from Chin and from Chris, uh, I want to take a, a few minutes to um, build out our tree configurations um, and try to use some of the things that they said in game uh, to help us do so. So we're starting here with just the inputs within GTO Plus, and some of the information is pretty standard. We have a starting pot of $65. Effective stacks are uh, $2,900. Um, and we have all of these options here for how we actually want to construct the tree. Um, for Chris's side, it's a little bit uh, less complicated. Um, from out of position, we're going to make, basically make the assumption that Chris is not going to lead um, unless he's leading the river here in this spot. Um, so uh, he's not really going to have a leading range on the flop, especially on this type of flop. Um, and you know, after Chin, um, based on the way the action goes, after Chin uh, c bets the flop and Chris calls. Chris is not going to lead on the turn. So really Chris isn't gonna have any leading ranges until he gets to the river. Now, from Chin's perspective, we can actually get a little bit more uh, sophisticated with this. Uh, we can um, uh, put in, so the way I've actually configured this is I've given Chin two bet sizes on the flop, uh, the quarter pot, pot sizing, which he does choose, um, and a larger 60-ish uh, percent pot sizing. Um, on the turn, I gave him three sizes, uh, a third, two thirds, and, and a full pot. And then the same thing with the river, I gave him one third, two thirds, and a uh, full pot. And I think that really um, gives a number of options to show um, what uh, the solver is going to prefer in different situations based on how ranges uh, um, interact on any given portion of the game tree. Uh, we can also look at the ranges of the two players, and I'm going to start by looking at Chin's uh, button open range. He is going to play um, knowing that he has a pretty good skill advantage over um, the two players left in the hand, which are uh, myself uh, in the small blind and uh, Chris in the big blind. Um, I'm also going to assume that uh, um, you know Chin not only does he know this, but he also knows that um, that combined with the fact that he's in p position means that he can open um, a pretty wide range. So I gave him a, a fairly wide uh, 
um, opening range of about 50% of hands on the button. Now, he might even choose to go wider than this. Actually, I feel like I might have been actually a little bit conservative in this. And, you know, he might open some, um, you know, some of these, uh, you know, offsuit King X's, um, you know, Queen 8, Queen Jack offsuits, uh, maybe some other, you know, one gappers that are offsuits. And he might consider opening almost all of the suited hands. But I think this is a pretty good... Uh, um, estimate for uh, for Chin's overall range. Now, Chris's big blind defense range is a little tougher. Um, I started with this range, and I uh, assumed that you know again this is not Chris's uh, range that he would play in a normal you know two five or five ten game. Um, from the big blind, I'm assuming he's going to be a lot wider than this. But I assume that you know he knows that Chin is a really really good player. Um, and he's going to be a little bit tighter than normal uh, from the big blind in this spot. Uh, so uh, you know, I have, uh, assuming that he's going to have some sort of uh, three bet range, and I, you know, assume that you know aces, kings, a queens, ace, king are always going to be in that three bet range. Uh, there's you know these hands right here that are in purple: uh, ace, queen suited, ace, jack suited, ace, queen off, and jacks are mostly going to be three bet so you know he has he retains about 25 percent of them in his calling range uh this next wave of hands so uh ace jack off king queen off king queen suited king jack suited ace 10 suited tens uh they are in three bets at a 50 percent frequency so 50 percent of them are in his calling range as well as some of these other you know weaker hands that end up being bluffs so um, ace five suited ace four suited are bluffed uh, uh, fit in the three bet range, fifty percent of the time, fifty percent calls, and then the bottom hands like king four suited, eight six suited, and five four suited. Um, I have them at fifty percent calls, fifty percent folds, and then finally uh, the rest of his suited broadways. Um, I have him mostly calling those hands, so seventy five percent are retained in his calling range, and then you know he's sometimes three betting those hands from the big blind here too. Um, I think. This was a, a decent starting range uh, to look at, um, and uh, it's about 20% of his overall range um, with, you know, another, like, 8 to 10% um, in a 3-bet range as well, too. <clears throat> now, we also have to actually build the tree, and um, I customized this a little bit. So we see that we have a starting pot of $65. Effective stacks are about $2,900. From Chris's perspective, which is out of position, um, I don't think he's going to be doing a lot of betting. And actually, I checked this box here, which is um, we're not donking, um, which is um, he's not going to be leading out here unless he's actually shown aggression previously. Um, and you know, I think this is fairly obvious, too, from uh, his check on the flop. He didn't even have any commentary on this. I don't think he has a checking range on this at all on the flop. Um, <clears throat> I did give him um, a half pot bet here on uh, the river if it is checked through on the turn. Um, we actually see that he goes less than that when we get to there, but um, we'll adjust that actually as we move forward in the hand. Um, from Chin's perspective, uh, it's a little bit more customization here because he is the aggressor and he is going to have uh, more options in terms of betting. Um, you know, Chris here as the defender is going to be playing a more defensive game here in this spot. Um, so as a the aggressor here, I think Chin, um, you know, is going to have uh, two bet sizes here on the flop, um, the quarter pot bet size, which is what he chose, and then this sixty percent pot bet size, um, which is a little bit of a larger bet here on the flop. Um, on the turn, I gave him three bet size options, which are a third, two thirds, and full pot. And on the river, I gave him uh, four bet size options, so a third, two thirds, uh, full pot, and then. Um, Oh, I did not give him two X pot. Uh, but anyway, so, so I gave him um, three bet sizes here on the river, uh, a third, two thirds, and full pot. So uh, this is configuration. I think it's a pretty standard configuration. Um, and um, looking at this first at equilibrium, we can see uh, that um, we have Chris here checking 100% of range. But I think the thing I want to notice, i just call out here first, is uh, Chris actually has an equity advantage on this board, uh, which is uh, something that surprised me immediately. Um, so, you know, he has an equity advantage. He has he earns fifty one percent of uh, you know his range has fifty one percent equity against Chin's range. However, 
Um, his EV is uh, $26 um, versus Chin's EV of $38. So, uh, you know, Chris is earning far less than 50% of the pot. And that just really goes to show uh, two things here. One, just the impact that position has, and Chin having position is going to be a um, a big advantage for him. But two, also the impact that nut advantage has here. So uh, we'll see actually as we get into some of the responses here in this spot, uh, the fact that you know, Chin, even though Chin's range is really wide, the fact that Chin um, can retain aces, kings, and ace, king, and Chris does not have those in his range, um, hinders Chris's ability to play a really big pot uh, in this spot, um, at least on the flop. Uh, so um, you're going to see, uh, you know, even though there is an equity advantage here, uh, it doesn't necessarily translate into EV. Um, so when Chris does check here at equilibrium, uh, Chin um, can bet the majority of his range here at equilibrium here. So um, in this spot, uh, Chin is, uh, I, I actually was really interested in this um, um, and I played around a little bit with different ranges here. Um, and you're gonna see some variations actually in Chin's response based on how these ranges are constructed and also based on what Chris actually does. Uh, but in an equilibrium environment, uh, Chin, um, um, Chin did mention um, uh, in game that he would be betting 100% of his range um, at equilibrium uh, he shouldn't be betting 100% of his range uh, it's uh, um, he's just too wide to be able to do so um, I, I was surprised here that it actually prefers the larger bet sizing with virtually everything in his range um, uh, so you'll see the, the pink is the smaller bet sizing the blue is the larger bet sizing and um, it's uh, you know he's betting his obviously his value hands like sets. Um, he's betting his value hands like two pairs. Um, he's betting a lot of his uh, top pair hands. Uh, specifically, you know, definitely everything that also has a flush draw here. So you'll see, you know, all of these ace x hands of hearts. He's putting bets in. But as we start moving down and into weaker hands, um, you know, uh, so as our kicker gets weaker and weaker, we're betting a little bit less and less. Um, if we do not have the flush draw to go along with it. Um, for the offsuit aces, uh, it's a mix here mostly, uh, and you know, generally preferring to have the ace of hearts in our range if we are betting this as well too. Um, and then as we start working our way down in our range, uh, we start implementing more checks, uh, particularly with hands that have showdown value. So uh, hands like you know queens, jacks, tens, nines, um, our 8x, uh, especially the ones with better kickers, um, are checking back pretty often here at equilibrium. Uh, and you know some of our other hands, uh, you know, our other 8x hands, we are putting into betting ranges if we have some uh, good backdoor equity to go to go along with them. So. Uh, you know, those hands could turn into bluffs on later streets, like, you know, 9-8 uh, with the 9 of hearts, um, you know, or 8-X with uh, the backdoor diamond draws. Uh, some of our low pairs, um, you'll see this a lot too, with uh, some of these low pairs can see bet here um, if they have a heart. Uh, and, and that's important because if you turn a set, you're not going to also complete a flush, and you can really turn that into a polarized uh, turn bet as well too. Um, and then from a draw perspective, he's betting a lot of his flush draws. He's um, betting a lot of his uh, uh, backdoor flush draws, um, particularly also if they're combining, you know, to have um, like backdoor flush draws and, you know, some straight draws or backdoor straight draws to go along with it. Um, and he's betting a lot of his uh, uh, straight draws as well here in this spot too. Um, against a bet, um, against this smaller bet, uh, at equilibrium, Chris is uh, raising this about 10% of the time, 11% of the time, um, not really doing a lot of folding. So the folding ends up being um, really hands that don't have strong uh, backdoor draws. Uh, so, you know, some of the weaker backdoor draw hands or, you know, hands that don't have backdoor draws at all, or just low pairs without a heart as well, too. Um, but, you know, hands as weak as uh, we'll look at, it's calling all of its gut shots. Um, so, you know, all of his gut shots are playing for either a call or a raise, all of its flush draws are playing for a call or a raise, and then even backdoor um, flush draws, it's playing for calls um, with all of its King X backdoors uh, um, or all of its pair plus backdoors, um, and then really just getting rid of some of the weaker 
um, backdoor flush draw hands as well too. So it's defending pretty widely. Um, at a larger bet, uh, it virtually has zero raising range um, and folding a little bit more. So some of the gut shots without a backdoor uh, turn into folds against a larger bet. Um, and then some of these same hands and then the lower pairs here that you know did have hearts now turn into uh, give ups on, on this board as well here too. So I think this is a good place to start with by looking at what this looks like at equilibrium. But I think what's interesting here is actually, um, I actually had a conversation. Um, I have a, a study group with uh, um, some people, uh, including Chris, and um, I shared my assumption of my range here with Chris. And he actually said that, no, he, he's going to be a little bit wider than this in how he actually defends Chen. So um, I ran this again with Chris's updated range. And what you'll see here is, is this is Chris's updated range. So, um, you know, one, he said he's going to be three betting a little bit more um, widely with these hands. So, you know, we actually gave, we gave him a little bit less of these top end Broadway hands in his range um, because most of them are going to turn into three bets. Uh, he's going to be a little bit wider in some of his flats. So we gave him a few more hands in, in some of his flatting range, as well as some of the weaker ace X hands, which, um, you know, Chris is also going to be defending as well too. Um, and one thing that's interesting is actually his equity goes up. Um, and, you know, we were adding a lot of ace X in his hands here, but I was amazed that his equity actually goes up to 50, almost 54% here and his EV goes up. So it's still not quite enough where he's earning um, half the pot, which again, it's crazy. He's earning almost, he has about almost 54% equity, but he still earns less than half the pot. Um, but uh, the hand plays a little bit differently if you assume that this is what Chris's range actually is. So again, we're checking a hundred here in, in Chris's, with Chris's new range. Um, but given this, uh, Chin's actually only betting, you know, 35% of the time. So, you know, I think this is an interesting takeaway right here, which is, you know, as Chin expects uh, Chris to have more um, ace X off in his range, um, the lower frequency at which he should be betting, because those ace X offs are never, ever going to be folding to a single bet. Um, he also never has a small bet in his range here in this spot. Um, and this is typical of what you normally see as the betting frequency goes down. Um, we're going to be pushing less of our equity through with these down bets, and we're going to be turning you know, more of our uh, range into a split of a polarized range where you're starting with betting hands like sets and two pairs, um, some are our best draws, and you know you start fading things down from the ace X. So, you know, we're betting ace queen a lot, and then ace jack a little less, and then ace 10 a little less than that, and etc. all the way down. Um, you know, betting only a third-ish of his range uh, for that polarized sizing while checking back, um, you know, two thirds of his range. Um, if he does choose the large sizing, Chris, you know, responds similarly to before, um, calling about 60% of his range and never raising here in this spot. Uh, and then against the small bet, uh, Chris also responds similarly. He, you know, calls a significant portion of his range, um, but, you know, only has a, a small portion of raises in his range here too, uh, about 9.3%. Uh, so I thought this was rather interesting um, looking at things uh, from an equilibrium perspective. Uh, but you know, as we know here, the game is not played in equilibrium. So uh, what I'd like to do next here is look at um, how each, how we think each player, uh, both Chin and Chris, will be um, playing on the flop and node locking accordingly to examine how the other player uh, should theoretically be responding based on uh, those uh, uh, those configurations. So let's get those sets solved set up and uh, we can uh, transition over to that. Pure range bet on this board. Pretty much going to bet 100% of my range here and take it from there. So he expects this, I presume. Also have pretty good, the classic bottom pair trip draw uh, for huge bets to come in on a later street. If he chooses to check raise here, I would probably put in some three bets, although I never expect to check raise on this board pretty much ever. 
So pot bean 65. I'm going to start with a very small bet size of $15. So chin bets one third, which makes sense because of uh, how many hands I contain and how often he C bets this texture. Thinking about the possibility of a check raise, but I am going to continue through a call. So the first thing we're going to do here is is look at uh, Chin's node locked range and how Chris should be responding to that. Uh, now we've already uh, demonstrated that Chris is going to be checking 100% of his range, so we don't need to necessarily look at that node. Uh, but what we should call out here is um, using and for all the rest of these. Uh, um, configurations. We're going to use Chris's adjusted range, uh, the one that he told me he would be using uh, for this analysis. Um, now, the first thing we want to look at here is um, what if Chin is betting 100% of his range? And in this spot here, I actually ran this multiple ways uh, because I think Chin could be splitting his range um, in a few different ways here. Now, what you'll see here is I gave him two different bet sizes, a quarter pot and 60% pot. Now, he actually bet $15. The solve is not going to um, uh, be different here if I put 16, 25, just because it's so small compared to the overall size of the pot. Uh, but assuming he's going to be betting about, you know, uh, $15 here as a small bet and then about $40 or so 60% pot as a big bet. Um, the numbers, you know, plus or minus a few dollars here, the numbers are going to be pretty much the same. Uh, so now the first way I actually split Chin's range here is um, what I know about Chin is that in a lot of these spots, he's going to like to have two bet sizes, a small bet size uh, for the majority of his range, and then a large bet size uh, for a polarized uh, component of his range. So the way I actually split this was um, I assumed that some of his top end hands now are going to fit into this large uh, bet size component. Um, I kept aces here as the small bet, um, mainly because uh, you know it locks up a lot of uh, uh, the hands that Chris might be continuing with. So, um, you know, Ace, Aces here is going to want to keep uh, uh, Chris's range wide because there's a lot of hands that just can't continue. Um, once he uh, puts a big bet in there with Aces, uh, you know, Chris is, is much, much, much less likely to have uh, the Ace X hands that would be calling those, those big bets. Uh, and he's more likely to fold there. Um, so, Aces stays in the small bet size. But you know, other sets, so kings and eights are big bets. Um, all of his two pairs are big bets. And, um, you know, some of his top pairs, so all of his ace queen, as well as all of his ace jack and ace ten of hearts are, are big bets. And then he's going to pair those big bets um, with some bluffs. And those bluffs are in this range, um, all of our uh, suited gut shots. Now, you know, I could also include some of these offsuit gut shots, but I think then you know we're going to be waiting towards over bluffing here in this spot. So I actually just only included uh, his suited gut shots, uh, and I also included some of these low pairs that I know Chin likes to include in a larger bet size uh, of the low pairs, you know, deuces through fives uh, with a heart. Now, what this actually results out to is that you know, Chin is taking his range and 12% of it he's putting into a larger bet size and 88% of it he's putting into a smaller bet size. Um, so a couple things to point out with this is, one, um, Chris's EV actually shoots up again. Uh, so you'll notice before that at equilibrium, his EV was about $30 compared to Chin's was about $34, 35 um, Now this shoots up to about $38 and Chin's EV is, is 27 So now at this point, um, you know, based on... Chin's response, the optimal, or sorry, based on Chin's um, node lock, the optimal response about this uh, against this node lock actually earns more money uh, than half the pot. So, uh, you know, the optimal response would be a good way to play against this strategy um, if Chin is choosing this strategy. Um, if Chin is choosing a larger bet size, uh, Chris basically should just be folding everything, including um, the ace most of the ace x hands now chris happens to have the ace of hearts but again it, this is kind of uh crazy to see that uh, you know ace 
10 ace jack even has uh folds here unless they have a heart um so uh which i don't really think you see in practice uh so you know you're gonna see um you know chris against chin strategy here should be really over folding to a, a large bet size, which, you know, again, you may or may not see. I don't think, I think you see some overfolding, but this is um, fairly significant from an older overfolding perspective. Um, against the smaller bet size, Chris actually should have a raising range. And, um, you know, Chin called this out um, in, in game that he doesn't expect Chris to ever have a raising range here because, you know, right, like Chris said, um, or like Chin said, uh, um, you know, Chris is not going to have the top end advantage here, and he's not going to have aces, kings, ace, king. You know, Chris does retain a quarter of a combo of ace, king off, but really he's not having the, he doesn't have any of those, you know, hands in his range. Um, he really shouldn't have a raising range because of that nut disadvantage. But, um, you know, if Chin, if Chris knew Chin's strategy was this, he should have a, a raising range, and that raising range is, um, should be fairly robust in this spot. So you'll see that, you know, against this small bet, um, Chris should virtually never be folding and uh, you know except for the really bottom end stuff without any back doors um, and he should be raising a, a decent portion of the time um, a, a very you know top end heavy linear range of um, you know a lot of his ace X's his sets his two pairs um, you, know, you see all of these ace X's and then pair that with, you know, some drawing hands, like basically all of his gut shots here. Um, a lot of flush draw hands here are putting in raises, uh, two card backdoor flush draw hands, particularly the lower ones here should be putting in raises. Um, and then some of these low pairs with, with hearts should also be putting in raises here too. So, you know, again, I found this really, really interesting that if Chin is deciding to play, uh, this strategy where he is, um, does have a polarized component and he's, um, you know, always putting that polarized component into a large bet size. Uh, Chris's response from an optimal standpoint should be to uh, combat that with um, a lot of raising on the small bets and uh, overfolding on the large bets. Now, uh, we realize that, you know, we're not going to have 100% clairvoyance over chin strategy. Um, it's just not something that is realistic. So, uh, you know, I also wanted to test the sensitivity of this here too. So, uh, you know, again, we, we know that Chin is still betting 100% of his range, but what happens if he takes uh, only a portion of those ranges uh, of his range here and um, puts it into that polarized sizing? So in, now what I did in this spot here was I basically cut his polarized range in half. So you'll notice here my kings or really any place where I have him choosing this large bet size. Now I split it as 50 50 so you'll see just as an example here um, for each of these combos we're putting half of the combos in this large bet size but then we're putting half the combos in the small sets a uh, bet size so what this does is this actually retains some of those you know top end hands in that smaller bet size range uh, so chris is not going to have as much clairvoyance over um, you know, does he retain really, really strong hands or and really, really polarized drawing hands um, in his small bet size? And, you know, looking at the EV here, this does drop the EV a little bit. So it's still higher than the equilibrium EV of, uh, you know, in the $30 range, it's at $35, but it's not quite at the $38 mark that, uh, you know, was it was at when, you know, Chin was putting all of his top end hands into the larger bet sizing. And, um, against this response it's somewhat similar against the large bet size so um which makes sense because the, the range is still the same it's still it's it's a smaller portion of it but you know the components of it are still the same uh chris is going to respond with just a lot of folds and you know he should be doing the same thing he should be folding you know hands like ace 10 unless he has the ace of hearts in his hand which you know he does happen to have uh but uh it's just something to uh, you know, keep in mind that, you know, it's, he should be folding a lot on this board to a large bet size. Um, to the small bet size, he still actually should be raising a decent amount, although not as much as before. So, so you know, when Chin had all of his top hands in the uh, uh, polarized bet sizing, Chris should have raised 50% uh, at an optimal frequency of, of his hands. Now it's closer to uh, 35 percent of his hands here 36 percent of his hands and he's shifting some of those into a calling range which now represents a larger portion of his overall range um, the overall makeup 
of his raising range is still somewhat similar. Uh, he's still raising uh, his sets. He's still raising his two pair. Uh, he's still raising a lot of the better ASEX in his hands, um, in, in his range, but he's now tapering off a little bit more and shifting some of uh, the worse ASEX into uh, just a calling range. Uh, he's shifting some of the gut shots into just calls instead of raises. So, you know, hands like the Queen-10, Queen-Jack, uh, Jack-10 suited, uh, he's doing it uh, purely raising with uh, either the hearts or the diamond uh, for the back door, um, but he's calling more with the, uh, you know, when he does not have either a flush draw or a back door flush draw uh, for the, the gut shots, um, raising them at less frequency. And, uh, you know, when he's doing so, he tends to have a heart in his hand uh, when he's raising those. Um, and then some of these lower hands, uh, you know, whether it's the lower pairs or some of the the lower, um, you know, either heart draws or backdoor diamond draws, uh, shifting them a little bit more into a, either a calling range um, or a folding range um, and out of uh, the raising range as compared to uh, the previous range that we, uh, the previous uh, solve that we looked at. But Chris is still raising a large percentage of hands. He's still check raising here, 36% uh, of hands. And, you know, that's uh, somewhat surprising. And it's somewhat interesting that he's uh, raising so much. But, you know, it makes sense when you look at Chin's range and you see that, look how wide Chin's range is. He has so many hands. And, you know, this is much, much different than what we see when we look at uh, like an early position versus uh, big blind defend where you know in, in that case the the original razor is not going to have all of these low end hands but you know we can just look at you know all of this is all this range here represents all of the uh, no made hands so this is just the nothing in his range but you know chin just has a lot of nothing in his range that he's betting uh, he's betting all of these uh, low um, gappers and, and low suited hands in his range and you know even the ones with backdoor diamonds have you know low equity right uh, um, but you know if they don't even have backdoors you know we're looking at 11 12 percent equity for a lot of these hands um, he's got a lot of nothing in his range and, and Chris can attack that through raising frequently so the last thing I wanted to look at here is you know we looked at a range where you know Chin has this split where he's polarizing with uh, the top end of his range, and you know we gave him a hundred percent of those combos, and you know we've also looked at it where we gave him a 50-50 split. I also want to look at and, and just test the sensitivity of this and see what it looks like if Chin doesn't have this polarized sizing and chooses to down bet everything in his range. So I, I ran the solve again, and. I ran this in a situation in which uh, Chin down bets everything. And what we see here is, is somewhat predictable that uh, the EV goes down yet again, and it goes down to 33. So it was 38 when you know he polarized with everything there. It was 35 when we had the split of 50-50 of those polarized hands from the big and small sizing. Um, and now it's down to 33 with everything um, being merged into this smaller uh, down bet range. What's interesting is we still see Chris raising, and you know we still see Chris raising a, a quarter of his hands. So I found this spot really fascinating, and I think it's something in which uh, I definitely uh, want to explore a little bit more. I think Chin's range bet is really good in a lot of situations against a lot of players. It's really common against uh, you know a defense range that is uh, you know really devoid of any of these top end nut hands, but the a better response if you know that your opponent is taking um, this bet one hundred strategy is to raise more frequently with this you know top end heavy uh, uh, linear uh, range um, because uh, Chin is going to be. Uh, really, 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 really wide. Now, does this happen in practice? Probably not as much um, for a couple reasons. Uh, um, you know, one, um, from a perception standpoint of, you know, um, 
Chin ha uh, Chris has to be worried about a, when a three bet comes in, and Chin mentions this that he might three bet Queen Eight suited at some frequency on the flop, knowing that um, you know Chris is going to have a hard time defending against three bets here without aces kings ace king in his range uh so that's going to make things much more challenging what there's also um you know it assumes is that chris is going to be able to play clairvoyantly and perfectly on future streets which um you know is not true um nobody's going to be able to do that uh, but also you know it's gonna be just difficult for him to navigate the rest of the hand out of position so now that we've taken a look at this from chris's perspective i want to actually look at this uh from chin's perspective and say well Really, how should Shin be uh, constructing on the flop uh, based on what we think Chris's response is going to be? So I'm going to pull up those solves and uh, uh, that solve, and we're going to take a look at um, what that looks like as well. Now, the next thing here I want to do is look at um, how Chin should be constructing based on what he thinks Chris's response is going to be. So we're going to fast forward and say, and, and I have... Chris's response here. So what I did was I actually node locked um, what we thought Chris's, what I thought Chris's response would be here in this spot. Now, a couple um, assumptions that I put here into play. Um, one, I'm actually going to assume that Chris does not have a check raise range here. Uh, may or may not be accurate. He does somewhat call that out on his commentary that he might have a check raise range here in this spot. Um, but, um, you know, Chin doesn't think that, that he'll ever face a check raise here. So, um, you know, I'm going to actually make the assumption that, that Chris does not have a check raise range here. Um, so he's only call, calling or folding against both the large and small bet sizings. Um, so let's start with the large bet sizings. Um, you know, if you recall from an optimal standpoint, uh, uh against a large bet size, uh, in that polarized range, Chris was only calling like 15% of his hands. Um, I do think he's going to call more than that. Um, I think uh, he's really calling, um, you know, I have him calling all of his sets, uh, his two pairs, um, all of his ace -X are are going to be continuing for one street. I don't think really any of his ace -X are going to fold to a single bet here. Um, but I do think he actually starts folding um, some of his uh, weaker hands. So uh, you'll see here as I actually have him folding any of his king X without a back door so he's he's not continuing against larger bet sizing uh, unless he has the diamonds um there uh, uh weaker pairs he's uh you know his 8x same thing he's only continuing his 8x if he has uh back door diamonds um and i have him actually folding even you know hands as strong as like pocket tens um even with a 10 of hearts uh to a larger bet size here on the flop uh, he's going to call all of his flush draws, um, but I actually even think he's going to fold his gut shots unless he has the hearts or diamonds um, here to a larger bet size um, as well. So um, what this equates to is about 40% of, of his hands that Chris is going to continue through a call on the larger bet size. Um, against the smaller bet size here, um, I think it's more closer to uh, you know the 80% range. So really anything of with any equity Chris is going to be continuing with against a, a quarter pop bet so you know this includes all the hands that we talked about um, you know sets two pairs top pair but it also includes uh, you know all of our middle pairs all of our weak pairs really the only pairs that we're getting rid of here are um, anything below the eight um, if it does not have a heart so we're going to get rid of all of those um, and then we're going to get rid of you know hands that are weak enough that they don't really contain uh, valuable um, um, cards. So, uh, you know, any flush draws continuing. Most of our back doors are are going to be folding here in this spot unless they have some straight draws to go along with it. So, uh, you'll see here is that I also included him calling hands like 10-9 of diamonds, 9-7 of diamonds, that, those hands that wrap around the 8, 7-6 um, of diamonds, um, hands that really can turn pretty well in some spots. Uh, but um, I'm f have him folding, uh, you know, some of his his weaker hands here, and it's really just it's the bottom of his range, the bottom 20ish percent of his range that I have him folding. Now, going back to our EV, we see that you know now Chris's EV shoots way down to to twenty four dollars. So so not having a raising range is um, fairly detri detrimental for Chris here in this spot, uh, and um, you'll also see that now when we look at Chin's response, now Chin back to betting 100% of his range. So if Chris is responding like this, which is if he's responding uh, in a um, call or fold only strategy, which is what you know we think might be happening here in this spot, uh, Chin 
can go back to betting 100% of his range here. And you'll see that actually he chooses mostly the large bet size. You know, some of the, you know, king x hands, pocket aces, and maybe some of the weaker ace x hands um, are shifting towards this smaller bet size. But for the most part, again, it's, it's choosing the larger bet size with virtually everything in range. So, you know, this is something that's interesting here is, is uh, if we think that Chris is, especially against this larger bet size, is going to be um, this might be overcalling, right? So this might be overcalling for even 40% of hands against this larger bet size. And what we saw before is, you know, Chris should be shedding a lot of his ace-x hands against, uh, especially the weaker ones against a larger bet size. Uh, you know, if he is going to be calling this much um, and then not necessarily coming back with raises, uh, Chin can, you know, bet considerably. And, you know, we saw this in-game in, with Chin's uh, commentary that, uh, he doesn't ever expect Chris to be raising this hand. And if he is not ever expecting Chris to be raising this hand, which is what would suggest from these node locks, then playing a bet all strategy is is a really, really, really good way to take advantage of that. And it's going to you know generate a lot of EV for him in this spot. So I think this is interesting. And I think this is an interesting way of looking at the flop. And we'll actually come back to this in a little bit to, to look at... Um, um, well, what happens if Chris does choose a raising range here too? But we've looked a little bit about at um, you know Chin's uh, response, um, how we thought Chin's response is going to be, or, or sorry, Chin's um, max exploit response against you know what we assumed Chris's range to be, um, and then we looked at you know Chris's max exploit response at what what we assumed uh, uh, Chin's range to be. Um, what I want to do now is I actually want to. Um, look at both of those node locks together. So I want to node lock what we think Chris's response is going to be versus how we think Chin is going to play and construct his um, large versus small bet split. And from there, uh, we're going to continue forward onto the turn and the river and see how, based on those assumptions of our flop construction, how uh, the hand um, should be playing out uh, going forward. So let's take a look at that solve as well. So now we've looked at uh, node locks for both Chris and Chin. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is push it to the turn and uh, look at um, how our assumption of Chin's range um, and our assumption of Chris's range uh, respond and how they uh, interact on uh, the future streets. So uh, you'll see here, and what I've done here is I've, I've taken the node lock uh, of the middling version of Chin's range. So this is the, he's betting 100% of his range, um, some of which of his range he is betting for a larger polarized sizing. Um, but we don't have full confidence as to um, how much of that range is either going to be polarized or staying in the down bet. So we're going to give of those hands 50% coverage in the larger polarized range and 50% coverage in the smaller down bet range. Um, for Chris's response, we're, we're still giving him no raising range and um, he's going to have uh, about a 40% calling range uh, in the uh, for the larger bet size, and then about an 80% calling range for the smaller bet size. Uh, looking at the EV here, we see that uh, Chris is going to, his EV goes down. So it goes back down to where the original equilibrium was. So um, when they're both playing these strategies um, going forward, um, Chris is going to be earning less than half the pot, despite the fact that he has over 53% equity um, with his range. Now, so he chooses the check and Chin chooses his down bet here, which we see from our uh, um, uh, our specific hand, Queen Eight of Clubs. Um, we're down betting that at 100% frequency. And then um, Chris's specific hand, his Ace-10, um, Ace of Hearts, 10 of Clubs, is calling at 100% frequency. So we both have um, those hands specifically in our range as well as a bunch of other hands. Uh, and we push to the turn of the Six of Diamonds. Uh, now. First thing to note is that our the equity of Chris goes up. So Chris's range equity goes up from about 53% to about 60%, which makes sense when you consider the fact that uh, Chin is narrowing some of his range. So he's diluting some of his range, uh, or sorry, Chris is diluting some of his range by folding some of those hands on the flop. 
Um, whereas uh, Chin does not dilute any of his range. Chin is uh, pushing all of his range through to the turn. So um, Chin still retains the width of his range, where Chris uh, does narrow somewhat um, and, and strengthens his range somewhat as well, too. Uh, so pushing forward, we can see that um, Chris is still going to check 100% of his range on the turn, which is what I would expect. Um, and the solver chooses to only bet uh, you know, Chin's range um, at 16% frequency, and it only chooses the large sizing, which is interesting. Um, you know, I do expect uh, him to, at this point, to have to split um, and, and check back because he is so wide. Um, it's a small portion of his range that's actually betting, and, you know, it's a what you would expect that could pull. So it's hands like uh, his uh, sets, his uh, his sets are pulling here. His two pairs are pulling here for the most part. Um, some of his best top pairs, like Ace Queen and you know Ace Jack of Hearts, are pulling here. Um, and then some of his uh, draw hands, so uh, flush draw hands, um, combo draws of uh, you know if you have the diamonds or uh, hearts uh, plus straight draws, uh, those are pulling as well. But that ultimately gives them gives him a range of. Uh, about 16% of hands uh, that are betting. Um, as we see here with our specific hand, Queen A of Diamonds uh, turns into a hand that can be put into a betting range because it does turn the flush draw as well. Um, but uh, the Queen A of Clubs is a pure check um, in this strategy. Now, I think this is interesting. I, I, I think this is, uh, um, it's definitely interesting to see that um, a large portion of uh, Chin's range is going to stay in a checkback range. He's going to have to. He's, this is not a hand that he's really going to be able to pull with. Um, you know, did, if he did have a hand like Pocket Kings or Ace King, um, he definitely would, would continue betting um, significantly. But he does cap himself somewhat um, by checking back on the turn. Um, he's uh, going to be continuing with a lot of his hearts and diamonds uh, as well, which we'll see is is somewhat significant uh, considering that a diamond falls on the river. Uh, he's going to retain less of those into his river uh, check back range. Um, what I actually want to do um, going into the river is uh, I want to um, first uh, node lock one of Chin's range, uh, so Chin's turn's range here, because I, I do think that uh, we can actually clean up t Chin's turn range um, a little bit before we go into the river. Um, and I've done that here on um, this uh, additional board, uh, which uh, going into the river here, I think he does bet a little bit more than that 16% of range. I think he bets, uh, you know, so I went through and said, okay, Chin is going to be betting, you know, still those sets and those two pairs, uh, but, you know, a little bit more of his top pair coverage, um, and then a little bit more um, hands that really uh, turned a lot of equity. So, um, you know, hands that he, where he still does have gut shots and open enders uh, that go along with the flush draws, I think he's going to continue barreling those. Um, but there are hands that uh, he, I think he does keep in checking ranges. And I think a lot of those are um, hands that have showdown value. So I think a lot of the weaker ace-x hands, uh, particularly the ace-x hands of hearts, uh, you know, some of these lower ace-x of hearts hands, I think they play really, really well in checking ranges and as well as just the rest of our weaker ace-x. Uh, you know, and the same goes for um, our king x hands that have turned uh, uh, flush draws or, you know, the uh, 8x hands that have turned flush draws, and then the 6x hands that have turned hard draws, uh, they just get a lot more showdown value. Um, and some of these kind of weaker hands uh, or that, that do have some showdown values, uh, but also have flush draw components, uh, they make really good check back candidates because they can not only river a flush, but they also can river, you know, trips or two pair. Uh, and you know, can face uh, resistance uh, from river bets uh, pretty nicely by strengthening back our check back range. Uh, and Queen Eight of Clubs, which we see right here, uh, you know, pretty much uh, fits squarely into a check back range, which is why you know Chin um, identified that correctly and uh, checks back uh, on this board. So uh, I'd like to actually you know use these ranges now, um, looking at uh, you know the this node locked uh, checking range um, and fast forward to the river uh, to see both Chin and Chris's frequencies uh, based on um, how these ranges are 
constructed and how they're interacting with one another. Uh, but first, I, I'd like to actually jump back over to Poker Out Loud uh, and take a look at Chris and Chin's commentary, both um, on the turn and you know on the river, to get some context into uh, trying to uh, make sense of some of the things that we're actually seeing in the solver um, and uh, to be able to make uh, st some conclusions out of uh, this analysis as well. So let's switch back over to Poker Out Loud and take a look at the rest of the hand. Double flush draw board here. I expect Chris to expect high frequency polarized betting. I think that at this point, he has a fair amount of continues with backdoors. Uh, he won't necessarily be able to bet those on the river. Um, too often it's gonna be really hard to find bluffs here. I also improve. I don't necessarily wanna release the showdown of my hand uh, on this exact card. So I'm going to check. This is interesting. I expected a pretty high frequency barrel from Chin. Uh, maybe he turned a pair with six, seven of hearts or something, or chose to see bet a showdown value hand. My target is pretty murky here because I expect him to check back most of the hands that I would be targeting for value on the flop. I, I am pretty unclear as to how he's constructing in this line. I don't think he has Jack-10 ever. Uh, potentially just an eight that he bet for denial, but whatever I bet, we'll just start with a bet. We have a good hand. Go for a uh, small bet. 30. So it's 30. All right, raise to 30 preflop call. That's 65, then facing 15. He's betting now third pot on the river, which is a river block, which he expects me to be pretty showdown driven. Um, I unblock a lot of his bluff catchers here. Um, so I could get thin and just raise like pretty big here if I wanted to, ripping extremely thin value, um, which is kind of cool uh, simply because he should expect a lot of my diamond combinations to be barreling through on the turn. Um, also his jack tens would just mostly be, can't really three bet. Um, So that's good. Um, so I only get three bet here by a flush. Uh, I'm kind of gonna go for it just simply because it doesn't look like I have like anything. Uh, especially when I choose the down bet with range. When I land here, um, choosing a raise size here is pretty thin, but kind of good. Um, so I'm kind of gonna go for it. Some really thin value. If he finds a three bet, then that's great. And I'm just gonna evaluate uh, at that point, maybe probably lean fold. Uh, so let's just kind of go for it and see if he makes a mistake. One time. I'm probably gonna uh, just put this in. I'm close to the top, probably only lose to like eight, nine of diamonds. So, when we get to the river here, um, we see that uh, against these ranges, Chris's equity jumps up again, and you know he has a fairly significant equity advantage. Um, I think both 
Chris and Chin call this out a little bit in their analyses um, that you know really Chin is is capping himself by checking back on the turn. Now, what I think Chris does um, fail to recognize here is uh, that uh, two things. Um, one, um, he. I think he assumes that Shin is going to be betting a lot more of his range on the turn uh, than he actually will. So uh, what we see here is Shin is actually checking back, uh, you know, a large portion over two third over three quarters of his overall range. Um, I would guess that uh, based on Chris's comments that he's expecting Chin to barrel at a much 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 higher frequency. Which uh, when we actually look at his range, uh, if he's doing so, he's he's doing so far 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 too widely. So. Um, so I think Chris thinks that range, that that Chin's range is, is is a lot wider than it actually is, um, and then the second point, which we'll get to in um, in a little bit more detail in a second, uh, is that Chris thinks that he is um, you know near the top of his range, which um, we can see that you know it's it's based on the ways in which he's constructing in his in his range, um, he's probably not near the top of his range now, you know. It looks like here we have uh, flushes, straights, sets, uh, two pairs in our range here, and that's because we do play a call-only strategy on the flop. Uh, there is a portion of this um, of these hands, uh, mostly sets and two pair, uh, that um, you know if Chris is constructing a flop raising strategy um, will not be in his range. Uh, but hands like flushes and straights that um, we have on the river. Um, I would not expect uh, Chris to really have those in a, in a flop check raise range, and I would expect Chris to check 100% of the time on the turn. So he should show up on the, on the river here with um, a decent portion of better hands in his range. Uh, that said, um, you know, as we see here, Ace Ten is is clearly a bet in this spot here, um, and mainly because you know, our, again, our overall equity advantage against this range is is fairly significant, and you know, Chris can bet um, with really all of his Ace X here in this spot. Um, when he does put the ace, uh, the bet in, um, you know, Chin's response is to mostly fold. Um, you know, again, he's still pretty wide in his range, and he's folding a lot of these bottom end hands, um, and calling uh, with a decent portion of hands like, uh, you know, top pair. Um, you know, some of his middle pair kings are going to be calling here, trying to pick off some bluffs. Some of his uh, weaker pairs are going to be calling, trying to pick off some bluffs. And then raising with any, you know, diamonds that he still has in his range or, you know, jack tens that, um, you know, potentially he has in his range as well, too. Um, now, one thing I think is, is really cool is Chin, you know, calls out that um, he's, Chris is going to expect his range to be really, really weak, which he does. And he can get really, really, really thin um, with uh, a, a raise of, of queen eight, knowing that he is going to really only be called or, or you know, really only be put in a three bet with flushes, right? Chris is not really gonna have a ton of, of bluffs in his range uh, unless he happens to have uh, the king of diamonds, which you know, even then it's unlikely that Chris goes and turns that just Naked King X of Diamonds uh, into, or sorry, Naked King of Diamonds into a uh, a three bet bluff. So you know, Chin play, puts in this this raise, which you know is played at some frequency here in the solve, which I think is a really 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 cool play. So um, you know, you know, it's it's definitely thin, which Chin calls out that it is going to be thin. But um, based on how he thinks Chris is going to respond. Um, uh, you know, he thinks he can get thin with this. Uh, so, um, you know, I think this is a, a really, really cool river play that, that Shin puts in, which, um, you know, based on the way he talked about the hand, I don't think he does this at 100% frequency. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, this is pretty in line based on where the ranges that we put into play uh, that, um, you know, Chin is going to raise this at some frequency. Uh, now, when he does put a raise in, it's a close call. Uh, you know, I can lock on Ace 10. And what you'll see here is if you compare the EVs of a call, raise, and fold, uh, the blues are the raise, and that's clearly punting money. So, you know, if Chris does put a raise in here with Ace 10, uh, a re raise, he's, you know, while it would get through in this particular instance, he is likely going to end up against flushes fairly often and just lose money. The EV of a call versus a fold is, is, virtually negligible it's it's a really 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 close spot um what you'll see here is what the solver prefers is um to put 
any hands that we have the 10 of diamonds in our hands into a calling range and then fold the rest of it. And so this is really just an example of, um, you know, how close these spots are and how much blockers do play a, um, a big role in this, right? So, um, you know, by having the 10 of diamonds in our hand here, we, we reduce the number of flush combos that Chin can have and um, pushes this more towards a call. Um, uh, by not having the ten of diamonds in our hands, we we increase the number of, of, of flush combos that Shin can have in his raising range there. And um, you know, again, this is this ends up being one of those uh, cusp hands. Uh, where I would recommend um, you know Chris plays this hand is really this ends up being more profile dependent uh, because Shin is just really really wide in his range. Um, it's just going to be hard for Chin to uh, balance a really good. Um, you know, bluffing to uh, 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 bluffing to value uh, a raise strategy here, right? So you know, Chin is supposed to be raising, um, you know, hands like uh, pocket jacks with the jack of hearts and jack of diamonds here in this spot, and I don't think that's really something that um, you know we're going to see at, at much of a frequency, right? But like, there's um, this is a spot where I think it's really, really, really hard to stay precise. So um, if Chris believes that uh, Chin is going to be, you know, a little bit more value heavy towards those kind of thin value hands, then Ace-10 just turns into a fold here in this spot, unless you happen to have the Ten of Diamonds. Um, if, uh, you know, he thinks that uh, Chin is going to be a little bit more uh, bluff heavy in this spot, so if, if, you know, Chin is going to be adding in um, you know, some other hands that, you know, may have some key blockers or other hands that may, you know, kind of function well as bluffs and, you know, put more hands like, you know, Queen A, um, Jack 10 into calling ranges here. Um, I don't think he's ever going to do that, but if he, if he does throw like, you know, maybe Jack 10 is a bad example, but like hands like King Queen or Queen 8 or Queen 6, if he's putting those into calling, um, um, regions and not necessarily bluffing with with those types of hands, um, or not necessarily uh, uh, raising with those types of hands, then Chris can probably lean more towards a call in this spot. But again, it's a really, really, really interesting and thin spot here um, when we actually get to this river and we see that uh, um, you know a lot of this depends on you know kind of some very small adjustments. So if Chin is just slightly imbalanced, this could be, you know, an easy call or an easy fold in this spot. Um, uh, so, you know, again, Chin kind of toes this line really, really nicely um, in, in this solution here, too. And the last thing I actually want to look at here is, is you know, going way back to the flop, we, we made this assumption that Chris is always going to have a um, uh, check call strategy on the flop. And... That may or may not be true, uh, but um, you know, I, I'm, I was curious as I ran through this. Is um, you know, this this is the output based on how we believe ranges funneled themselves into on the river. Um, but a lot of this is you know started with what we thought both Chin and Chris's flop ranges uh, were. Now. If we back up to the flop and, and actually put some check raises into Chris's range, that's going to dilute some of Chris's range going forward. Uh, so based on all of the other actions remaining the same, but adding some raises into Chris's flop uh, range, um, how would that impact what our river decisions look like? So I ran, I ran the solve for that as well too. And we'll open that up. And what I did here was, um, again, it's the big rate bet range. I kept the same uh, call or fold strategy. So we kept the same call or fold strategy against the big, big bet range, but against the smaller bet range, I gave Chris some um, raises. So I said that Chris is going to raise his pocket eights. He's going to raise um, his two pair, and then he's going to raise some of you know half of his uh, top pair there. So uh, you're going to see his ace 10 hands are going to dilute by 50% because he's going to raise that somewhat. And he did mention in, in video that he might think about raising this. So I want to see what it looks like if he does include some of those ace 10 hands in a raising range. Um, and then to balance things out, I also have him raising um, his uh, gut shots here at 50% frequency as well too. So as we work our way down to the river, um, what we're going to see is... Let's just kind of solve this a little bit further. But what we see is actually 
it doesn't change frequencies that much, uh, at least from a river perspective. So we're still betting around 60% of our range. Equity is not quite 70-ish percent. It's a little bit lower because we're you know reducing some of the better hands in our range. But we still do have, from Chris's perspective, um, we still do have a number of flushes because you know we're not really check raising any um, diamond hands. Um, we still have a number of straights because you know we're not check raising all of our uh, jack tens. Um, we don't have we, the only sets we have now are pocket sixes because you know we do get rid of our pocket eights here. Um, but we also have some two pairs left as well too. So we still do have hands um, higher up in our range. So you know Chris's comment again that this is the he's at the top of his range um, is not really that true. Uh, he um, he's at the top of his asex rate region of his hand of his range uh but it looks to to you know from this he's going to have you know 40 plus combos of flushes straights sets and two pair um that are better uh in his uh in his range so you know of his overall range of about 180 combos uh you know about 20 percent of of that and 20 plus percent of that um is uh are, are going to be better than his uh you know asex uh hands um, ASEX is still a bet. East 10 is still a bet here, um, you know, on the, uh, uh, on the river. Um, and then, but what we see here is actually, if Chris does have a, a check raise range on the flop, um, Chin's queen eight actually shoots up and becomes way more of a, of a bluff here. So Chin's raising range, um, increases here. Um, and now he's raising really all of his flushes, all of his straights, all of his sets, and, you know, a lot of his two pair hands here too. So, um, you know, as Chris's range dilutes a little bit um, on the flop, and, and he comes back and he funnels into the river with a little bit of a weaker range, uh, this block becomes raised at a much higher frequency. So you know, uh, again, it, it's it's still a little thin as Chin mentions, but it's um, you know, and the EVs are you know, if we look at our EVs of Queen Eight of clubs and Queen Eight of. Uh, um, of sorry of raising and of calling these hands they're still somewhat comparable here but what we do see is that you know Chin's just raising this at a much higher frequency when he does raise this um, we see very similar um, takeaways here that it ends up being a pure call with a ten of diamonds blocker and a pure fold uh, with uh, without the ten of diamonds blocker so I think what we can determine from this is um, the way um, the river action plays, uh, Chris's bet is good. Um, it's a it's a good bet out to try to get value from a lot of Chin's range because he is going to have equity um, and he's going to be calling with a lot of worse Ace X hands. He's going to be calling with um, you know some worse kings in his in his range. Um, but Chin does have uh, some flushes probably that um, he does not continue barreling, barreling with on the turn. He's going to have some straights. He's going to have uh, you know pocket queens that that checks back on the river there, um, and he's going to have some two pairs there too that are um, just better and that can put in raises and potentially um, you know get value um, on the river there too. So um, you know while he can get value from a lot of hands, he's also going to get raised at some frequency here. Um, and when that raise does come in, uh, uh, Chris is going to want to have key blockers in his hands. Um, you know, so uh, a hand like uh, King Jack in this spot here with the King of Diamonds is going to be a um, a better uh, call in this spot than a hand like Ace-10 um, without any diamond, uh, mainly because having a diamond in our hand um, reduces the number of uh, of these 18 flush combinations that that Chin can have in his hand in his range, um, um, and you know especially if it's the king of diamonds because there's a lot of king x of of, of diamonds here um, flushes combos, um, but having a, a diamond in our range um, or in our hand um, really should tip us towards actually making a call here in this spot. So. Um, I'm going to shift back over to the PowerPoint now and um, go through some key takeaways. But I think this is a really, really cool hand. I think it's a cool way of, of looking through this um, um, when looking at a solver uh, of you know breaking down those uh, those ranges and just how challenging um, these uh, big blind defense spots are, even when we flop really, really, really well. So, so I, think I think this is a really, really, really cool hand, hand and um, it really uh, parallels nicely, nicely with a lot of the... the uh, out of position defensive work that I've been doing on my website right now and just is a great example as to how hard these spots really are. 
um, especially from the out of position perspective. And you know how much the in position player just happens to just win a lot um, uh, in these spots. Uh, so you know some of these key takeaways I have here. Uh, Chris, you know, does have an equity advantage in this board, and that's amplified as we see uh, if he includes more offsuit uh, ace x hands. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into an immediate advantage. Um, um, and that's because that he does have um, that positional disadvantage, and he has a nut hand disadvantage. Um, if Chris does assume that Chin is going to bet 100% of his overall range, uh, he should develop a, a top-end linear check rate strategy, um, which you know I don't think we see really that much at all in practice. Um, and you know as we showed in the video, that actually should increase uh, as Chin splits um, if he includes stronger hands as a larger bet size. Uh, so, you know, as Chin dilutes his range a little bit more with the smaller bet size, um, you know, Chris should really attack that smaller bet size with a larger check raise strategy. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, Chris, he, while he does have a good hand on the river and he definitely um, should be uh, betting uh, to get value from Chin's wide range, he does have an equity advantage that's pretty significant on the river. Uh, Chin, um, uh, you know, pushes his entire range through on the flop um, and checks back on the turn, severely capping his range. Um, Chris is not at the top end of his range. He does have flushes. He does have sets. He does have straights. Um, and <clears throat> Ace-10 is, is just not a, a, the hand that he really should be defending unless he has uh, a reason to do so, like um, having um, the 10 of diamonds as a key diamond blocker, or um, if he really does believe that Chin is going to be um, uh, skewing more bluff heavy than value heavy here with his river raise. Uh, from Chin's perspective, uh, uh, Chin should be um, actually checking more of his range at equilibrium on the flop um, if he does think that Chris is going to retain more of his offsuit ace x um, or if he thinks that Chris is going to respond with um, some uh, raises. Now, um, you know, we, we did hear Chris say, uh, Chin say that he doesn't anticipate Chris to raise at all. And, you know, as we did show in a in our uh, um, node lock example, if Chris does not raise um, at all on the flop, uh, then we go back to a pure range bet scenario from Chin's um, exploitative response. Uh, so, uh, you know, if if Chris does retain more offsuit ASX and if Chris um, is going to be employing that check raise strategy, Chin should be checking more of his range uh, on the flop and not range betting. Um, adopting that polarized split of his range on the flop, uh, you know, while still betting 100% of his range uh, is good, um, unless uh, Chris does anticipate that. And if so, this goes back to the Chris uh, having a check raise frequency. If Chris, if Chris does have a check raise frequency against a down bet, um, that's going to be uh, make things problematic for Chin on um, when he does down bet and, and cap himself. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, Chin's river raise for value is is really thin, and I think it's an awesome, awesome play. It's it's really, really, really cool uh, um, getting that thin. I think a lot of players don't get that thin there, um, but it's really, really, really good if he thinks that. Chris is going to defend by, you know, over calling with hands um, and under raising. So if he's only raising um, and three betting his, his flushes there, um, you know, he's going to get a lot of really, really good value by and by not necessarily getting um, uh, and not necessarily getting bluffed off of that value at all, too. Uh, so, um, you know, I guess the lesson is always is uh, uh, don't play out of position against Chin uh, because that is uh, usually a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, playing out of position against uh, um, a really good player and, and obviously Chin is, is an outstanding player. So uh, that, uh, you know, can be somewhat problematic uh, in this example here too. Uh, so that's uh, been my analysis. Um, I, you know, um, I, I love putting these things together. Um, definitely we'll be doing more so in the future. Um, if you uh, have any uh, anything else that uh, you'd like to, uh, or any questions or comments, you know, feel free to leave them in, in the, the comment section below. Uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, my uh, Twitter and Instagram are above. Uh, the um, You can check out my website, uh, lukic.io. I do a, a lot of uh, uh, cool work, I think. Um, all really data-driven work where I'm, I'm using a lot of solver uh, um, solvers and, and other tools uh, 
uh, to generate data sets and analyze different poker spots. So uh, love to do more of these. And if you have any um, other you know, questions, comments, or would like to collaborate, uh, please feel free to reach out with me anytime. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for watching and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.